One, I'm a 28 year old male and a customer service representative for a very reputable insurance company in the US. I've experienced in this job in different companies ever since I finished high school. As a disclaimer, I do not and have never worked in underwriting. I am just in charge of regular CSR stuff. I do not have a say on insurance claims and that's an entirely different department. Also, I am an outsourced employee. Most customers don't mind, some occasionally ask where I'm from. And there's the very rare butthead that asks for someone that speaks English as soon as they hear my accent. I don't care, I'm used to it. Generally speaking, American customers are very nice and patient, more than the ones in my country. So I never really understood where do all the retail and customer service horror stories from the internet come from. Today I did. So Karen calls, as soon as I answer, I hear a lot of background noise. And the first thing I do after introducing myself is ask for the policy number. I hear a man in the background yell between a lot of noise and I realize it is in fact the policy number. And I ask him to repeat it since I could not hear very well. Karen decides to take the lead and let me know that she is driving through the interstate while calling me and that she does not want to waste her time. I'm like, okay, how can I help you? I shit you not when I tell you this woman started screeching to the point I had no idea what she was saying. Yes, I am not a native English speaker, but it's never been a barrier for me. I could not for the life of me understand why this woman was so angry. Between the insane yelling, I could make out something about her policy being cancelled and her being charged anyways, and seeing the direction this call was going, I decided my best move was to immediately contact a supervisor through chat to get some assistance. I inform Karen of this, and I ask her to give me a few minutes while I check in my side of the screen what is happening with her policy. Karen, however, decided that I was a genie, and I was supposed to grant her wishes and solve the issue she was having without even knowing what it was, and without checking for possible solutions. She decided I was not allowed to place her on hold, but I've had my share of angry customers, and I know better than to let them take control of the call. So I explicitly tell her that if she wants my help, she will need to cooperate with me, and let me figure out what is going on. She reluctantly agrees, but says she will be counting, when I specify the hold will be no longer than five minutes. First soup interaction, and I'm just like, I have no idea what this woman wants. She's yelling at me, very angry. What is happening here? We start piecing together emails, notes, and everything left, and realize that she requested for the policy to be cancelled, and provided proof to have a backdate cancellation. And it all was processed smoothly. She even got a response telling her that she would get the refund she expected. And now I was even more confused. My assumption was that maybe she was just angry because she hadn't been refunded yet, which is just bank time shenanigans and nothing we can do about. So I'm like, okay, ma'am, don't worry, you will be getting your refund, it's just bank timing. And that's when she informs me, at least in a coherent way, the real issue. She was magically charged again last night, so I double check, triple check with soup. There are literally no traces of this supposed charge she got last night, don't get me wrong. I don't really believe she was lying about it, we just had no proof of it. So I ask her to send us a copy of the bank statement so we can issue a refund right away. And she just loses it. Once again, she starts screeching about how she is driving to go into surgery, how she is going to sue the company, me personally, all the colorful insults you can imagine, including my accent and country of origin, how we stole her money and she wants it back. I insist that I just need some record of it to issue the refund. I genuinely try to reason with her, explaining to her that I can't just issue a refund for someone who calls asking for it when it's not showing up in our system and that I genuinely want to help her. Apparently, she was so freaking angry, she was driving like a maniac and got pulled over by the police and was given a ticket. She asked for my name so she could send me the ticket as she was not going to pay for it because we were the ones causing her distress. I kindly explained to her that she shouldn't be calling while driving and that it was not our responsibility. However, I gave her my name. Good luck with that. I'm on the other side of the world. Ha! She said that's what hands-free is for. 
and I had to hold back laughing because it only hit me how stupid this woman actually was. The part that really got under my skin was not the insults, the yelling, the racism, or whatever. It was just how insanely unreasonable this woman was. Her concern was completely valid, and I told her multiple times that she has a right to be upset and a right to call us to get things fixed. But she needed to cooperate with me, and she was just hell-bent on releasing her anger and frustration on me. She literally would scream insults at me and stop and say, What else can I call you so you can understand how angry I am? The worst part is, in my employee handbook, I am 100% allowed and justified to hang up on a customer like this. Karen thought she had some sort of hold over me, but it was not the case. I could have ended the two-hour-long call at any time I wanted with all the verbal abuse she was throwing at me. But I still wanted to help her because I did believe that if she was being charged it was unfair, and I had to fix it. I started to get suspicious when she consistently refused to send me proof of the charges, no matter how much I reassured her that this would be fixed as soon as she did. It came to the point where she started telling me that if she died in surgery and made her husband a widow, it would be my personal fault. Don't ask me why, but that made me snap. For the first time in the call, I told her not to speak to me like that, and not to say stuff like that. She was so thrown aback from my reaction that she calmed down for five minutes, give or take. I actually had hope then that maybe we could end this on a good note, but to no avail. Karen still wanted me to trust her word that she would be charged $59 on a cancelled policy and wanted the money back. I finally told her that if she was not willing to send proof to dispute the charges with the bank. She said she shouldn't have to call her bank and I told her, You've told me many times that this is illegal and fraud. Given what you've told me yourself, I strongly encourage you to dispute the charges with your bank. I asked if there was anything else I could do for them and I ended the call while they were still insulting me. I changed my status to take a breather and realized most of my co-workers were looking at me extremely concerned. Apparently, the yelling could be heard through my headset. My supervisors, more than one joined in to help, congratulated me on keeping my cool and keeping control of the call. I still feel guilty because I couldn't help her. I'm not saying this for pity points, I really do. I was so willing to help her. I love my job. But she just wanted someone to be mad at. Fuck you, Karen. 2. Almost 30 years ago, my dad retired from the army, that's important to the story, and we all moved from the barracks to an entirely different county. Not overly fun for me or my sister because she'd just joined secondary school and didn't want to leave her friends behind, and I just didn't want to move again. If you're not familiar with the British Army, soldiers used to get posted places, invariably places like Germany, Switzerland, Cyprus, etc. It was 50-50 of if the whole family was posted with them, depending on how long they were away for. By the time I was eight, we'd already moved at least four times, that I can remember. Anyway, the Ministry of Defense used to have old soldiers' quarters in places, and when the barracks in the areas no longer needed them, Retired soldiers and families would get first dibs on the houses. Mum and Dad found this house, and we set about packing up again, and moving again, but this time for good. Yay! About six months after we'd moved, we'd almost made it our own, and had some family friends over for dinner. We're all in the dining room. Ooh, like an actual room separate from the kitchen and living room. I know, I was amazed. I'd never seen one sitting to eat, and I mean all of us, grandparents, two cars, three sets of friends, three cars, us, one car, so it's very obvious from the outside that the house is not empty, and a lot of people are there. Dad looks up from eating and his jaw drops. There is a woman just wandering around the garden, she is sniffing the flowers, looking in windows and generally behaving as if the house was a house for sale, checking its metaphorical teeth. It wasn't even as if she could have just walked down the side of the house and into the back garden. She would have had to unlock and open three gates. Dad goes out with a couple of his mates, all ex-army and rugby types, big blokes, hard to miss. And this woman glances at them, then continues poking around the garden trying to get into the shed. What do you think you're doing, says Dad. I'm looking at the garden, all brass. 
My dad's friends say, We see that. Why? What are you doing here? This is my house. Get off my property. What do you think you are? The woman shrugs. My son was going to buy this house. I want this house. I wanted to see what I could do with the garden when he buys it. Dad stares. WTF do you mean when he buys it? It's not for sale. I live here. No, you don't. My son wanted to buy this house. Mate, we're going to go check on the families and call the police. You okay with her? Yeah, make sure the kids stay inside. Get the hell off my property, Dad says to the woman. It's not yours. It's mine. I live here. By this point, we've opened the window to get a proper listen, and Mum has lost her shit. Proper mama bear reaction. Her two babies are inside, along with six other kids that she's known their whole lives. She flies out the door. Get the hell off my property. Get away from my husband. Get away from here, she says. Calm down, love. It's okay. Go inside. I'll get rid of her. This woman, with zero sense of self-preservation. Who do you think you are? This is my house. Get away from me, you crazy fat bitch. Dad has to grab Mum on the way past before she ends this woman. I don't want some unhinged woman in my house. Get off my property. Thankfully, the police arrive and escort the woman off the property, telling Dad to invest in locks for the gates. It's Dad's turn to lose it. He explains loudly and at length to the police that this woman had to unlock a few gates and shows them how the woman got in. As they're getting her to the car, she declared that she'll get us out of her house. It's her son's house. She lives here. She'll get us out. Dad tells the police he's pressing charges. The woman's tone changes. Suddenly, it's not her son's house at all. She didn't mean any of it. She's very sorry. She can't be charged. I don't know what came of it in the end. Mum and Dad wouldn't tell us. But I still remember trying to work out if she was crazy or what. But either way, we still live in the house. And we all still love it. It's got a dining room. 3. This happened last weekend and blew my mind. So I'm teaching my pup how to swim in a local off-leash river area in my city. The water isn't horrible, but it's not necessarily nice to swim. It's rocky and seaweedy and kind of gross. I'm fully prepared to go in if necessary for my puppy, but it's not something I want to do. Anyway, so we're trying to convince my pup to go further into the water by throwing sticks and a few floaty toys. Eventually, we reach the point of, Hell nah, not going to do that, Mom, with my pup, who decides not to get the ball I threw. I don't want to leave the ball in the water, but it's far enough that I'd get my shorts completely soaked to get it. Not a problem, though. There's plenty of other dogs around. I ask some owners if they can encourage their dogs to get it, and they can keep the ball. So at this point, we have multiple owners trying to encourage their pups to go get it. An unknown dog comes flying out of nowhere into the water and goes to swim towards the ball. Great. I see the owner, a Karen, come up holding the toy. I say her dog has my ball, but she's welcome to keep it. I don't really care, I just don't want it in the water. She kind of ignores me. By this point, her dog is out of the water and drops the ball. The owner throws her toy far in the water, but her dog doesn't go for it. Karen is confused until she sees the ball, then she goes wild. She turns to me and goes off about the ball. This is your fault that my dog won't go to get the toy. Dog hyperfocuses on one toy and won't go for others. Oh, sorry. Well, you can keep the ball. I don't want your stupid ball. Now my dog won't get his toy. It's expensive. I keep losing toys like this here, it's so ugh. Which, why are you bringing expensive toys to a leash park anyways? She then grabs the ball from her dog and throws it at me. I shrug and put it away. At this point, I'm just going to leave, so I start packing up. This seems to reinvigorate Karen, who stumps over to me again. What are you going to do about it? What, about the toy? Well, I have the ball now, so I hope your dog will get it. Or there's plenty of other water dogs here who will get it. So you're not going to go in and get it for me? Just no. I'm not going to swim out and get her dog's toy. She doesn't take that well and starts going off again, repeating herself for a while. I eventually say, why don't you go get it, Dad, if it's that expensive? You need to take responsibility. Responsibility for what? 
You're the one that brought an expensive toy to an off-leash dog area and threw it in the river. This whole thing is your fault for throwing the ball. You need to go get it. At this point, the other owners and dogs have cleared out, all giving Karen a look. I realize that conversing isn't going anywhere, so I simply pack up and leave. In the background, I can hear her screaming at her dog to go get the toy, and the dog owner is walking by to send their dog to get it. I wonder if she ever got it. Not too satisfying of an ending, but WTF. This is a grown woman expecting another person to jump in a river to retrieve her dog's toy? 4. Little memories like this have stuck in the back of my brain for decades, and I think I've finally gotten a use for them. To entertain strangers on the internet. Growing up, I was fortunate enough to be able to travel and see bits and pieces of the world beyond my home state. This is well before the age of the mighty Karen, cell phones and such. This was back when phone numbers had seven digits. So my mom, brother and I, as well as a couple of relatives, were on a Caribbean trip via cruise line, carnival if you're curious. I was nine or ten years old, so given the fact that there were kids groups that spirited me away while older relatives, most of them were in their upper twenties or older, did the adult things, saw comedy shows, drank, etc., even my brother was put in the teens and young adults group, which was a group different than the kids' group. My group consisted of anywhere from kindergartners to early middle schoolers. Naturally, by day two or three of the week-long cruise, best friends had already been made, and we all kind of sort of knew one another. Given that for about four hours a day, we'd all be corralled off from our respective caretakers to hang out, days at sea, as opposed to ported, were particularly long, so our activity advisors usually had lots of stuff planned in the evenings. Well, on one particular day, they managed to secure the promenade dance floor for the kiddos. There was going to be a dance competition, wherein prizes would be awarded whenever the counselors and a few appointed kid judges decided what the theme of the competition was going to be. One of the competition themes comes up, Weirdest Dance. This was the only one I had a chance of winning. Trust, I'm not a dancer, but I'm weird and that's a 50-50 shot. The prize was a pair of cheap plastic sunglasses that had the name of the cruise line on the side. They definitely just had a whole box overflowing with them back in their youth staff break room. So it goes without saying, I won that competition, weirdest dancer. I would accept that with pride. I remember the song. I remember why I did the dance I did. I remember the movie the song was in. So they call me out and the counselor hands me a little plain white box wherein the sunglasses were. I'm just about to open it when I feel a feeble yet insistent tug on the box. A small child, probably four, said, Mine! And to try to yank the box out of my, I'm literally twice your size, hand. I didn't know who this kid was and nobody had ever seen him before, but he was holding onto the box with this indignant, angry look on his face. I didn't let go, but... I didn't try to yank it out of his hand. I just looked over at the counselors, who were probably, in hindsight, not really trained to deal with semi-disciplinary issues. Well, the kid had his own firepower. We had never seen him before because his mother had never brought him to one of the kid meets. I say that because she had decided that with this being an at-sea day, this would be the day to do it. I might add that this was on the fifth or sixth day late stage in the cruise's seven-day expedition. His mom had been supervising her child since the counselors didn't really know if it was a good idea to leave a young child alone with perfect strangers at this point. And so, in a style which would not come into vogue for another twenty years, a blonde, middle-aged, pixie-haired, rotund woman comes over to nine-year-old me and says, My child won those. Hand them over. I ask, uh, is his name my name? She responds that they called his name, not my name. The counselor comes over and confirms that they did indeed award it to me. The mother responds with, This is my child's only time hanging out with kids his own age. Don't make it a bad memory for him. The counselor looks at me. I look at her, like, huh? And I acquiesce. They're just cheap sunglasses. The child gives me this look that can only be described as smug little shit and hops off to open his prize. Well, not a minute later, the counselor slips me another box while the kid is off, and his mom opening his sunglasses box. 
I got some stupid gaudy blue shades that I would cherish for years to come. You can never lose a cheap pair, you only ever lose expensive sunglasses. The music started again and the dance party resumed. I wore my sunglasses proudly, even though the place was decorated like a neon club. Well, we heard whining, loud bawling, coffee cries. The kind of crying where there were no words, only hoarse groans of a child scorned. The kid was clutching a pair of sunglasses, which he seemed none too excited about. His face was red and utterly wet with tears and snot. The mom steps on the dance floor, once more in beelines right towards me. My child wants to trade with you, she says. I say, huh? She tells me, my child got pink sunglasses, he hates pink, and blue is his favorite color. I put on my best nine-year-old deal with it face and said, sorry, I like blue too. If I only had a second chance... If I had a second chance to hit her with an anti-Karen missile with my big 33-year-old meme brain, I would. But alas, what could have been? Instead, I got the pleasure of watching her drag her crying child out of the dance club. Through my blue sunglasses. 5. Back in 2012, I was living in Japan, working as an English teacher. I taught at four different schools, rotating from school to school on a weekly basis. This story takes place at the school furthest away from where I lived. The train ride home was roughly an hour and 15 to 20 minutes. I finished teaching my classes and was at the station waiting for my train to arrive. There was a middle-aged Japanese man, Mr. Shima. He looked at me, a 32-year-old Caucasian male, and probably thought to himself, Oh, look, a guy Jin, a foreigner, he's going to be my new best friend. Mr. Shima came up to me, put his arm over my shoulder, and starts talking to me as if we've been friends for years. He reeked of cheap booze and bad curry. I didn't want anything to do with this man, but two things that were driven into my head during job training was that us foreign English teachers were the faces of the company and we were also ambassadors who were privileged to be living in Japan. So we needed to be on our best behavior at all times. With this in mind, I politely responded to Mr. Shima, but kept my responses short and blunt in the hopes that he would lose interest in me and walk away. While that tactic didn't work, after a while my train pulls in, I bid Mr. Shima farewell and ran into the train, praying that he was waiting for a different one. Unfortunately, he followed me in and sat right next to me, Showing no respect for personal boundaries, I asked him where his stop was, praying that he would get off the train shortly. Well, my rotten luck, Mr. Shima's stop was just a few stops before mine, so I was going to be stuck with this man for over an hour. I tried thinking of excuses to get him to leave me alone. I pulled out my textbooks and said, Hey, I need to prepare for my lessons tomorrow. Can you please leave me alone so I can prepare for my classes? Mr. Shima responded, No, 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 you can do that later. Let's talk and hang out. I need to reiterate that this was for work and I needed to focus on it. But Mr. Shima kept saying that it could wait and that we needed to hang out. After this and maybe another attempt or two at getting him to leave me alone failed, I decided to just suffer through the train ride with him pestering me. So about an hour later, which felt like an eternity to me, Mr. Shima is still violating my personal space and obnoxiously talking to me. I was chomping at the bit to be rid of this man as we got closer to his stop. Due to his limited English, drunken slurring, and my limited Japanese, I only understood about half of everything he was saying. But what he said next completely caught me off guard. Hey, you wanna get off at the next stop and look for prostitutes? No! <clears throat> no thank you. Well, why not? because I have a girlfriend back in the States and don't want to cheat on her. Oh, do you have a picture of her? Now, I'll admit I didn't have a girlfriend at the time. I lied to Mr. Shima, trying to think of an excuse to tell him why I didn't want to look for prostitutes with him, rather than tell him the truth that he was an annoying, obnoxious drunk that I couldn't stand. Fortunately, I did have a picture of a friend from college in my wallet that I pulled out and showed Mr. Shima, passing her off as my girlfriend. He looked at the picture and said, Oh, she's beautiful. She should be thankful to have such a loyal born friend like you in her life who won't cheer on her. You know, you need, 
You need a good, loyal Japanese wife. He then spots two younger Japanese girls, probably in their early to mid-twenties. He ran up to them and yelled, Hey, either of you two single? I'm looking for a good and loyal Japanese woman to marry my gaijin friend over there. Pointing right at me. Mr. Shima then pulls out his wallet and starts throwing money at the girls, and continue to scream, Eh, take my money. How much will it take to get one of you to admire my friend? At this point, I'd had enough of him, and I was afraid to see how he was going to harass these girls if I stayed on the train any longer. The train pulls into the next station. It was still a few stops away from his. But I rushed up to him and said, Oh, Mr. Shima, this is your stop. Oh, uh, really? Yep, this is it. Time to get off the train. I escorted him off the train. He smiled and waved back at me, saying that we should hang out again sometime. I got back on the train, smiled and waved as the doors closed, and the train took off again. I immediately ran to the girls and apologized profusely, saying that I was so sorry that he had harassed them, he was not my friend, and that he was just a drunk who had been annoying me for over an hour. The two girls thanked me for coming to the rescue. They assured me that they were all right, and that one, they now have a crazy story they can tell their friends, and two, they have all this money that Mr. Shima threw at them. The girls invited me to sit with them and talk till we got to my stop. They tipped me some of the money that Mr. Shima threw at them for my heroic actions, and I walked back to my apartment. In hindsight, could I have handled this situation better? Probably. Do I regret how I handled it in the spur of the moment? Definitely not. Once again, I was terrified thinking about what Mr. Shima might have done with these girls if he'd stayed on the train. But in the end, I don't wish any ill towards him, and I do hope he managed to make his way back to his final destination okay. But what would you have done? How would you have handled this situation? Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Idiots in the Wild, episode 119. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, please do hit the like button. If you'd like to get the videos a little bit early and support the channel, you can do so by clicking on the Patreon link and becoming a patron. And you can do that for pretty much any amount you desire. Also in the description, you'll find a link to the Hellfreezer merchandise store where you can get yourself some nifty Hellfreezer merchandise. And you can also make donations through any video or stream if you wish to do so. These are not required, but they are very much appreciated. Thank you kindly. Alrighty, let's see. No other business today, so let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... Is there anything you buy that you don't technically need to buy, but you always find ways to justify it? Speaking for me personally, I once a month... Once a month? No. Once a month buy bottled water, and that's a month's supply. Uh, the water in Scotland is fairly decent, the tap water is decent, it's drinkable, but I prefer the taste of the bottled water. Uh, and as I can't really drink caffeine or things like that anymore, I do like being able to buy something I can buy and open and keep in the fridge. That's a preference, that's how I justify it, but I'd love to see what you guys have to say. Please leave an answer in a comment below. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.